Say you want to get into the car selling business. You save up and eventually get a few cars to sell. But the local big car dealerships perceive your small business as a threat. They sabotage your business by accusing you of stealing their cars, paying for laws so they can legally take your cars, and when you still refuse to back down, they straight up murder you. This happened in America, not with cars, but with cattle, and they call it the Johnson County War. Even today, 130 years later, the conflict paints people's perceptions of how a wealthy elite can exploit a corrupt government and become a bloodthirsty curse. But not your government, though. I'm sure they're just fine. To me, it was really a volatile time. In Wyoming, the cattle roamed for miles and miles during the winter. And then when they came, when there was a roundup in the spring, there would be a lot of baby calves. These rich cattle barons were established in this land, this beautiful Wyoming land, way before the Homestead Act. And so they had been using all this land for miles and miles as their own. And so when the Homestead Act was passed, and a lot of people started flooding west, and they settled in Wyoming. The story goes that in mid-19th century Wyoming, late season settlers stuck on the Oregon Trail had no choice but to winter over and were forced to abandon their cattle to their fate. When spring came, the settlers noticed to their surprise that their abandoned cattle actually got through the winter in pretty good shape. Which is not a surprise really when you think about it. This is bison country after all. Now after the native tribes had been forced onto reservations, the land was basically a giant free-for-all. It was a big open range. As early as 1870, ranchers and investors were springing up in the territory and were beginning to make fortunes off the cattle business. And it was a tempting business model. If you were an investor, you only needed enough investment capital to bring in a herd and build a couple of shacks. You didn't pay for the land since it was in the public domain, and you didn't need to buy any feed for the cattle. You didn't even need to really watch them. You just let them wander around and graze. Many of the men who invested in this business probably wouldn't fit your mold of what you think a typical cattleman looked like, but you'd be surprised at who shows up when the rate of return on investment is around 35%. More than a few investors were younger sons from European nobility, particularly Britain. Since they weren't first born, these men couldn't inherit their family's titles, but they still had access to their family's wealth. For the ranch hands and cowboys actually doing the work, the two busiest times of year were the spring and fall roundups. In the spring roundup, everybody's cattle were gathered, sorted, and branded, and in the fall, the cattle were again gathered and sent to market. These roundups lasted months and could employ hundreds of men. Just like a lot of other tough jobs, cowboys subscribed to the work hard, play hard philosophy, and so these roundups also served a social purpose. After work, the men would get together for horse races, card playing, or just talking and telling stories by the fire. In 1873, five cattle ranchers formed what would become the Wyoming Stock Growers Association or WSGA. Over the next couple of decades, the WSGA's members included some of the richest and most influential men in Wyoming, who also began to enter public office. The wealthiest owned million-dollar homes in Cheyenne, which became sort of their home base. Cheyenne's population exploded and claimed over 11,000 residents by 1890. The symbol of Cheyenne's opulence was the Cheyenne Club, where the town's elite socialized and networked over the finest foods and drinks imported from back east. While cattle barons bankrolled large-scale cattle operations, a different kind of investor was also making their way into Wyoming territory. These were people investing their lives and futures, looking for a new life, a fresh start. Many took advantage of government programs like the 1862 Homestead Act that allowed homesteaders to claim 160 acres of land, provided they lived on the land, improved it, and paid some small processing fees. The number of homesteaders, or nesters, as the cattle barons called them, steadily increased. Of the nesters, one man said, They did not have much of this world's goods, any of them, but their cabins were their castles, and they were as much lords of all they surveyed as any one of the cattle barons. Quite a few of these immigrants were college-educated and brought their specialized skills to new up-and-coming towns like Buffalo, the largest town in Johnson County. By 1890, Buffalo could boast more than a thousand residents who were hoping they could convince the railroads to build through their town. The people whose ranches and cabins dotted the landscape also earned a reputation for helping each other out. They had to. Wyoming can be a very unforgiving place to live. It was customary to put up an out-of-work cowboy for a week or two, and during Wyoming's dark winters, the settlers entertained each other with social events. One small rancher remembered, 
The largest dance given in the winter of 1888 to 1889 was at the now celebrated T.A. Ranch. It was a large, roomy house had just been built, and the floors were smooth and nice to dance on. That rancher was Oscar Flagg, better known as Jack Flagg. Jack had come to Johnson County in the early 80s and was friends with many of the people there, including another cowpuncher named Nate Champion. After his death, Flagg would be described, probably pretty accurately, as fiery, quick-tempered, and a bitter hater of his enemies. Acquaintances declared he was never known to go back on a friend. 1890 was a watershed year for the West. The census taken that year concluded the frontier, the line dividing civilized settlement from untamed wilderness, had finally disappeared. 1890 was also the year that Wyoming became a state. The citizens elected Francis Warren as their governor, but a few weeks later he left office to become one of the state's senators. The other senator was WSGA member Joseph Carey, who owned the CY Ranch near Casper. Amos Barber became the state's acting governor, with a special election set for 1892. Although there had been years of prosperity, times were getting tough for the cattle barons. Throughout the 1880s, the large cattle herds had consistently overgrazed the land, and beef prices were dropping back east. Furthermore, a disastrous winter in 1886 and 1887 killed off as many as half the animals. The animals that did make it were scrawny and barely fetched a third of the price they had just a few years earlier. Owners recorded huge losses, with one man even losing 120% of his holdings. When he was asked how that was possible, he replied, I lost all that I had, and it took me 20% of what my herd was worth to find it out. Many ranches folded, and unemployment soared for the rank-and-file cowboys and ranch employees. For the men who could get work, they found the business had changed. Cattle owners were looking to cut costs however they could. 27 wagons had participated in the spring 1883 roundup. By 1888, the number was down to three. Flagg recalled, There was no fun. No excitement of any kind. The barons had instructed their foremen to allow no gambling around the wagons, no horse racing on company horses. The good old times were gone, and the boys were beginning to realize that they must take up land and establish homes for themselves, or leave the country. When homesteaders staked their claims, they did so on the highest quality land they could get to, which of course denied the cattle barons access to that land. There were ways of dissuading homesteaders from blocking ranchers' access, from buying the homesteaders out to other, more intimidating methods. The purpose that the landowners in Wyoming, the cattle baron, was to kill the settlers with the pretense that they were cattle wrestlers rather than settlers looking for a place. The WSGA perspective was that homesteading and other smaller cattle operations enabled what they said was the greatest threat to their trade, cattle theft. The murder of Ellen Watson and James Averill in 1889 had provided the cattle barons with a blueprint on how to handle stubborn settlers, and that included portraying anybody who crossed the WSGA as cattle rustlers. A network of Cheyenne newspapers used every opportunity to assist the wealthy business owners. Among them was Asa Mercer, owner and editor of the Northwestern Livestock Journal. Asa had gotten famous back in the 1860s when he had organized Mercer's Bells, a group of eligible young women and Civil War widows he brought to the Pacific Northwest to marry the men settling there. Now he was in Wyoming, comfortably making a living as a mouthpiece for the cattle barons. Using their connections, the WSGA maintained its authority over all matters beef. When it was pointed out that maybe the government should have control over CAD regulation and not a private organization, the WSGA agreed. A new government body, the Wyoming Livestock Commission, was formed, and then immediately staffed with WSGA members. And some of the policies these guys came up with were doozies. The most infamous was the Maverick Law, where orphaned, unbranded calves were seized and only sold to WSGA ranchers, no matter who had a claim to them, but that was by no means the only one. The Livestock Commission also created a rule that allowed the commission to seize suspected stolen cattle as they were brought to market. They could also confiscate the proceeds from any sale. If these had been your cattle, you now had to make a trip from wherever your ranch was to Cheyenne to prove your case to the commission and get your money, which could take days. And you can guess whose cattle was always being suspected of being stolen. As Jack Flagg described the situation, the scheme was so secretly worked by the thriving commission that no one had an opportunity to take any counteraction. And as the shippers were all poor men, they were not able to take any legal steps right away. Despite these rules, many small ranchers kept working their herds because, well, they had to. Their livelihood depended on it. 
but as large-scale ranches continued to lose money, the cattle barons doubled down on cattle theft accusations, particularly in the Powder River country, the area covered by Johnson County. Now, had any cattle been stolen in Johnson County? Of course, people steal stuff everywhere. But was it happening on the scale the WSGA alleged? Probably not. Johnson County citizens actually had a reputation for being honest and law-abiding, which isn't surprising if you've ever lived in a rural area. Everyone knows each other's business, and the quickest way to get yourself ostracized is to screw over your neighbors. But that didn't keep the cattle barons from painting Johnson County as a lawless haven for cattle thieves. One of the issues the barons had to deal with was the criminal statute itself. In order to successfully convict the person of larceny, a prosecutor had to prove to a jury the accused had taken the property from a victim with the intent to deprive said victim of the property. That means you had to find out who the cow had belonged to, which might not be easy if the cow was missing a brand or the brand had faded. You also had to take into account the worth of the stolen property. Property worth $25 or more constituted a felony and could send you to prison for up to 10 years. Anything worth less than 25 bucks was a misdemeanor. The max time a thief would get was six months in county with a $100 fine. By the 1890s, the going rate for a cow had dropped to 15 to 20 bucks, well below the felony threshold. And some modern businesses are faced with a similar situation today. For example, in 2014, California passed Proposition 47, which changed the felony threshold for most theft crimes to $950. Since then, Prop 47 has been cited as emboldening criminals to steal from stores, since they know the value of what they steal won't come near 950 bucks, and the worst case scenario is that they'll get a misdemeanor citation if they're caught. Today's California business owners have reacted to the thefts by closing up stores to prevent further losses. Wyoming's cattle barons reacted a different way. They went on the offensive. Johnson County did have some effective law enforcement. For a good part of the 1880s, the Johnson County Sheriff had been Frank Canton. Canton had a reputation as a tough, relentless man, even ruthless. He caught Bill Booth, who was wanted for murder and oversaw his hanging, the only legal hanging done in Johnson County. There's no doubt Canton was good at his job, but he might have given some of the townsfolk a bit of a Judge Dredd vibe. Part of the issue might have been that Frank Canton wasn't actually Frank Canton at all. In reality, he was Josiah Horner, a Texas outlaw with a history of robbery and murder who had escaped from prison. This wouldn't be confirmed until decades later. You see, there's an unofficial code in the Old West that we don't see much these days. And part of that code was that when you met someone, you didn't pry or ask about what they had done in their past life. You just judged the person that was standing in front of you. People came out west to start over, so don't go digging up dirt and mind your own business. Sheriff Canton didn't run for re-election in 1886. Instead, he took a job as a WSGA range detective, investigating reports of cattle theft and making sure nothing happened to WSGA property. When Canton decided to run for his old job again in 1888, he lost election to William Red Angus, a Buffalo saloon owner who was fairly popular around town. So Canton kept his job for the WSGA. But one of the men who utilized Canton's services was another Frank, Frank Wolcott. Frank Wolcott liked to be called by his Civil War rank, and so Major Wolcott had made a prominent name for himself in Wyoming. He'd briefly been a judge and even presided over one of Bell Drury's cases, Small World. Major Wolcott had a reputation of being uh, abrasive and bossy and overbearing and bullying and, well, just a guy who didn't like to be told no. By the 1890s, Wolcott was hemorrhaging money and believed the main reason for this was the cattle rustling that had to be running rampant throughout the Powder River country. In the summer of 1891, Wolcott, along with several others, would become the architect of one of the most notorious plans in the West, involving hit squads, assassinations, and eventually, an armed takeover of an entire county. How do we know this? Because one man confessed. Next up, a small-time Idaho miner finds himself caught in the middle of a Wyoming range war. <laughs> 